Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. But anyway, what stirs you? What gets you excited? If I had my opportunity to get my feet under the same table with you like at a meal, what subject matter could I bring up that would make your boat float? I mean, it would put air in your sails. It would put wind under your wings. I mean, you just have all kinds of opinion about that. Maybe if I said Hillary Clinton, you know, you get see your reaction. You know, I, I just hit a button. I want us to all understand, we've all got hot buttons. We've all got buttons that stir us. Would you just give me an example of what might that be in your life? I, I know one thing, motorcycles. I know you, that, that's a hot button. Every one of you have got, uh, got opinions and, and your favorite type of bike. Uh, um, I've got a bike out there that was given to me about six months ago by some men up in a church that I preach at in Chicago. It's a, a Honda... Uh, uh, I was going to say Viagra. That's not right. Oh, Honda. Okay, yeah. Honda. 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 Magna. Magna. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. A Honda Magna 4 out there uh, that I thoroughly enjoy. I had to sell my Honda Hurricane 1000 in order to pay for shipping for that guy. That's a much nicer. Anyway, I, I, what, are, what are hot buttons for you? Clemson Tigers? No. No? Okay. And what is? Politics. Politics. Yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? Politics. Uh, they, they say never discuss politics at the, at the dinner table. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, anything else? I know um, something that uh, stirred me just last night was I watched, and I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you know Red Skelton was a very famous personality that was on TV a lot back in the 60s, and, and, uh, and he uh, had a weekly program, and he was very, very good, very, very dramatic was Red Skelton. A lot of, a lot of neat stuff. But there's a very serious, very serious monologue that he does about the Pledge of Allegiance. And he talks about each word, and uh, by the time you're done with that short little episode that may, maybe last two minutes, it'll bring tears to your eyes. There's also another little uh, monologue that he does where all he does was he, is he acts. He doesn't say a thing. But he's an old man at a parade. And he's waving at people, you know, and he's doing this as the marching band comes by. And then all of a sudden, Old Glory walks by. And that old frame just stands up and he salutes because he's a veteran. Brings tears to my eyes every time I see him do that. My point is this, friends. Every one of you, there's not an exception, even Caitlin. Every one of you have hot buttons. Every one of you. God created you that way. God created you to be emotional. There's nothing wrong, Christians, with being emotional. God has created you to be an emotional creature. And may I just ask you another question? Why do we have Memorial Day? Tomorrow is Memorial Day. Why do we have it? Well, we have it, if I can just put words in your mouth. We have it because we want to remember. Well, why do we want to remember? So we don't forget. Well, why don't we want, want to forget? Don't want to do it again. We don't want to do it again. Those that don't learn from history are destined to repeat it, aren't they? Yeah, good, Tom. But what's another reason? Why, why do we need to remember? Because, folks, you've been created to react to your memory. Your memory can help to stir you. And this will shock maybe some of you. But God wants to stir His people. He wants you stirred. You know why? Because stirred people do stuff. Stirred people act. Sedate people don't. When you're lukewarm, and by the way, that's the state that God hates most in the Christian, is lukewarmness. When you're lukewarmness, when it comes to Bible, you're kind of, whatever, take it or leave it. You are exactly where the devil wants you. God said, I wither you are hot or cold, but lukewarm I spew thee out of my mouth, Revelation 3. So my friend, when we get emotional, when we get stirred, that kind of acts as a motivator. We're kind of moved. I see out there Tom's pickup truck, and he's got a big American flag on there and a big POW flag on there because he wants us to remember. When you walk into a church auditorium, many times there's a communion table up in front of the pulpit, and on that communion table it says, this do in remembrance of me. Our memory is to stir us. And ladies and gentlemen, I would like to take you to a portion in the Bible 
where God wants to stir you. Could I show it to you, please? You might find this fascinating. I'm going to take you, and I'll be really impressed if anybody gets what I'm talking about. I want to take you to a book in the Bible that was written by a man who knows he's about to die. He, he knows he's going to be dead within weeks, if not months. And he's writing this to just kind of his last will and testament, if you will, kind of sharing his heart, kind of just leaving the church in order as he knows he's about to go home to heaven. He's not worried about death. No godly Christian ever is because we know the best is still yet to come. So this man is not worried about the death he's going to die, but he writes this one last will and testament, kind of a valedictorian address. We're in graduation month graduation season, you're going to look with me, if you're tracking, you're going to look with me at a valedictorian address. Does anybody know what little book in the New Testament I'm talking about? Tom, it's on you, brother. Second Peter. Second Peter. Dang, Would you turn that down, please? Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. And uh, let me show you something here if I could. Verse, verse number 12 is where I'd like to start. Second Peter chapter 1. And... Um, the, the Bible says, I'll, I'll give you a moment to find it, 2 Peter chapter 1, again, Peter knows he's about to die. He's even going to tell you that in this little brief passage we're going to look at. But look what he says. He says, verse number 12 of 2 Peter chapter 1, Wherefore, I, so he's getting personal, folks. That's the first time he's used the pronoun I in this passage. He is getting personal, he's sharing his heart. Wherefore, I will not be negligent. In other words, this is important to me, Peter is saying. To put you, and who is you? All Christians. To put you always in remembrance, or memorial, if you will, of these things. What's these things? Well, in verses 1 through 11, people, Peter has summarized Christianity. He has summarized the purpose of the Bible. He has summarized your Christian life. He's talked about how the Lord wants to use you. He has gifted you with grace and peace and knowledge and life and godliness and a divine godlike nature, if indeed you're saved. He's talked about all of that in verse 111 and your responsibility to that. So then he says, to, I want to put you in remembrance of these things. Let me read on, verse 12. Though ye know them. In other words, you, you've heard this before. And be taught or established in the present truth. Verse 13. Yea, I think it meet. And ladies and gentlemen, that word meet there is translated elsewhere in your King James Bible for the word right or righteous. So Peter is saying this is a righteous thing to do. This is a good thing for me to do. And ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest to you that what I'm doing to you this morning is a good thing. What I'm doing to you is something from God. This is a right thing to do. And what is that? Well, let's read on. Yea, I think verse 13. Yea, I think it meet. As long as I'm in this body, this tabernacle, to stir you up. Did you catch that, Christians? To stir you up. God wants you stirred. God wants to stir you. Could I ask you a question? When's the last time you heard the Word of God and you walked out of that service and way down deep in your heart there was kind of a, hmm, hmm, I want to do that. I want to be better in that area. Hmm, I'm convicted. Folks, that's stirred. And if it's been a long time since that's ever happened, you are in a state of spiritual sickness. You need to wake up. You need to get right. God wants to stir you. In fact, every time this book is open, every time you come to a service like this, you ought to leave. If your heart is soft, if your heart is tender, you're going to leave stirred. You know why God wants you stirred? Because you're going to walk out that door and you're going to do stuff for the kingdom of God. You're going to do stuff that lasts for eternity. God wants to stir you. That's what Memorial Day is all about. We, we want to stir ourselves as, as American patriots, as American citizens. We're, we're moved to think that I have relatives that gave their life for my freedom. That moves us. Well, folks, far more important, and I am very thankful to be an American, don't get me wrong, but far more important than that is Christianity and your salvation. And God wants to stir every one of you. Let's read on. Could I please? Verse 13. To stir you up. How did Peter want to do it? By putting you in. What's the next word, folks? Remembrance. 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 Remember. What are you remembering? You're remembering what you got saved from. You're remembering where you could be if it weren't for Jesus Christ. 
You're remembering how good He was to you. You're remembering all the good things that He's done for you. And that stirs us, folks. God wants His people stirred. Let me read on. Verse number 14. This is fascinating. Look what Peter does to you. Verse 14. Knowing, Peter's saying, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, my body, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Christians, when in the world did Jesus Christ show Peter he was going to die? He's just referred to it. So there was some time in Peter's life where Christ told him, you're going to die. Can I refresh your memory? Do you remember when Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Ladies and gentlemen, how long was Jesus Christ ministering on the earth after he rose from the dead? 40 days, close. 40 days. And during that 40 days, he made many appearances to saints. One of those times, the disciples, led by Peter, the ringleader, he was quite a character. Peter said, I'm going to leave Judah, I'm leaving Jerusalem, and I'm going to go back to my old occupation, fishing. And he went up to the Sea of Galilee, and the other disciples followed him. And he went up there, and they fished on the Sea of Galilee. Folks, I personally have been on the Sea of Galilee. It absolutely teems with fish. It is a very populated lake. I saw when I was there huge catfish that would surface near a restaurant where they were throwing out garbage. And these catfish, massive catfish in the Sea of Galilee. It's a very populated by fish lake. These guys went out there, and the best time to fish is at night. So these disciples went out on one of their boats, and they fished all night and caught nothing. That's pretty hard to do in the Sea of Galilee, not to catch anything. I have a feeling God was in control. They caught nothing. And towards the morning, as dawn was approaching, there was a voice from the shore that said, Children! Try the other side of the boat. Do you remember this? And they did. And immediately the Bible tells you, I love this. The Bible tells you they caught 153, specific number, 153 large fish. And the very next phrase there says, and the nets did not break. Miracle alert. Miracle alert, people. The nets did not break. Immediately, John says, It's the Lord. Peter said something to the effect of, You think? And in the water he is. Peter swims to shore. The Bible says that Peter got to shore, the disciples joined him shortly, and Jesus had breakfast ready. Folks, do you know, and this is my opinion, I'm preaching from the white spaces in your Bible right now, but do you know how I think the creator of the universe and the sustainer of the universe makes breakfast. <coughs> breakfast. <laughs> there was a fish and who knows what was there. Folks, I would have loved, this is my personal opinion, I would have loved to have tasted those fish. Those are fish that never touch water. My personal conviction, I think they tasted like lobster or crab. And they were great fish. Now that's my opinion, okay? Don't, don't walk out of the room with it. But anyway, Jesus has breakfast ready. They're enjoying a heaven-sent, God-made, better than IHOP, breakfast. And while they're enjoying that breakfast, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Hey, Jesus. I mean, excuse me. Excuse me. Hey, Peter. Look at me. Peter, do you love me? You know what Peter's answer was? I like you. That's what it says in the Greek. I like you. Jesus said the second time, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, I like you. Jesus said a third time. Folks, why did Jesus ask Peter three times? He denied him three That's times. That's exactly right, Tom. He had denied him three times. So the third time, Jesus uses Peter's word and says, Peter, do you like me? Mm -hmm. Peter said, you know I do. And Jesus said this, Peter, stop going after smelly fish and start going after the souls of men. By the way, that's God's call for every one of you too. Stop going after smelly fish and go after the souls of men. Oh, and by the way, Peter, you're not going to die a natural death. You are going to die a martyr's death. Do you remember that? What was Peter's answer? 
What about John? What about John? Jesus said, that's none of your business. That's none of your business. No concern of yours. Folks, that's what Peter's referring to here in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 14. He knew that he was going to die a martyr's death. He knows he's about to die. And so look what he says in verse 15. How does he summarize that? Moreover, verse 15, moreover, in other words, I repeat for emphasis, moreover, I will endeavor. Am I saying it right? I'm doing it by memory. Let me look here. Moreover, yes, we're okay. I will endeavor, in other words, this is my goal, Peter says, this is my goal, that ye, you Christians, even in Greenville, South Carolina, that you may be able, after my decease, after my death, to have these things always in, what folks? Remembrance. remembrance. Why? Why remembrance? Because God has created you to be emotional. One of your hot buttons, Christian, ought to be that I've got a Savior. I can live for my Savior. I've got the Word of God. I can obey it. And when you hear the Word of God, when you meditate on the Word of God, my friend, you've been created. If indeed you're really saved, you've been created to be stirred by that. Stirred by just reminding you of what you already know. You already know about Jesus Christ. You already, I'll never forget many years ago I used to be a youth pastor in Connecticut I was a youth pastor of Calvary Baptist Church and it was the custom of that church that when somebody wanted to join and become a member they would walk the aisle during the invitation you know, you know what I'm talking about when I say invitation it was at the end of the service they would walk the aisle and one morning one Sunday morning a girl about the size and make and age of Caitlin walked the aisle she came from a single mom home. She walked the aisle and she whispered in the pastor's ear, I'd like to become a member. Well, it was the custom of that church. I don't know what kinds of churches you've been at and what they were like, but at this particular church, it was the custom that when anybody wanted to join, they made an appointment with the deacons. They went before the deacon board and gave their testimony, gave the story about how they came to know Jesus Christ. So that's what we did with little Janelle. Janelle walked the aisle, and that evening at about 5 o'clock before the evening service, all I think we had about six deacons and two on the pastoral staff, the senior pastor and me, the assistant pastor. So there are eight men, you with me? There are eight men in this conference room. We are going to interview what was probably, I know Caitlin's going into the fifth grade, this girl I think was in the third grade, but she came in, she had been coached by her mommy, which was a good thing, the chairman of the deacon board was a big, tall man with a rich radio type voice. And he said, I'm going to try to imitate him. He said, well, Janelle, why don't you give us your testimony of how you came to know the Lord? And little Janelle launched into a 30-second simple little testimony of how she came to know the Lord. She said something to the effect of, I knew I was a sinner. I knew I deserved hell. I wanted Jesus to forgive me of my sin, and so I asked him, and I now know I'm saved and going to heaven. When she finished that simple little testimony, folks, there wasn't a dry eye around the table. You had eight burly men. Not one of us had a dry eye. You know why? We were stirred to be reminded that salvation is so rich that great man can't explain all of it, and yet a third grade girl had gotten saved and, and it stirred us. Friends, that's what the Bible endeavors to do in your life, to stir you. When's the last time the pages of the sacred scripture brought tears to your eyes? When's the last time you walked out of a message, out of a presentation of God's holy, eternal, infallible, living word with a movement in your heart thinking, I want to live that. I want to do that. I want to obey that. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please understand, I'm not talking about a weirdo. I'm talking about a genuine Christian. God wants to stir us. He wants to stir us by reminding us of His Word. Could I ask you a question? What's the opposite of remembering? Forgetting. Forgetting, yeah. Are you aware of the fact that you're good at that? I am very gifted at forgetting. And God knew that. God, we are very, very gifted at forgetting. And one of the things that causes us to forget is distraction. 
when I was a youth pastor at that same church, every Wednesday night I would meet with a youth group, a bunch of teenagers. There were probably about 20 to 30 young people in that youth group. And every Wednesday night I would preach at them. But before I preached at them, we would go outside and have a game. And there was a nice huge park just not far from the church there. And we would go to that park. But way over on the opposite corner of where we were was every Wednesday night. You can always rest assured that the devil has stuff going on on Sundays and Wednesday nights when we should be in church. But there was an official. And folks, when I say official, you need to understand it was official. There was an official high school softball girls league every Wednesday night. And these girls were serious. I mean, they were serious. They had the $200 glove. They had that black stuff that you put under your eyes. They had the official uniform. And they would get out there. And it was, it was a league. And there would be a game going on. And there were parents in the stands, all of them hoping that this sport will give their daughter a college education because she's so gifted, she's so good, she's going to get a scholarship. They all think that, don't they? And so they were having their official game. And, but we were way over on the opposite corner where we were not in their way. But I noticed people that one of the center fielders on one of the teams would be doing this. She'd be standing there like this, you know, home plate's way down there. She's in the outfield, okay? And she'd be standing there going, hey, better, 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 swing. Hey, better, 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 swing. She was watching us. We were playing a game. Chances are we were probably playing our own rendition of softball. I used to have a game where I would take a playground ball, about you know, those red rubber playground balls, I would blow it up tight, and we'd have a softball bat, and I would be the pitcher, and that big old ball would come, and then those teenagers used to love to smack that thing, and it would fly, and that ball was big enough so that even the guys could hit it. And boy, they loved it. So I, that might be what we were doing that night. But anyway, the center fielder, hey, better, better, better swing, and she was watching us. Well, my, my wife, who's a registered nurse, immediately got my attention. Mike, Mike, Mike. She was standing you know, behind our teens. Mike, look, look, look. We, we turned around and there was that girl unconscious. Unconscious. And here's what had happened. My wife went running out there and, and she regained consciousness and she was kind of oozy, but let me tell you what had happened. Hey, batter, 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 swing. And the batter did what she said. The batter swung and hit a beautiful pop fly right to this girl who was watching us. And the ball hit her right in the back of the big old massive softball. Boom, hit her right, knocked her cold, cold cock, cock right, out, right out on the field. She, she was able to regain consciousness. And, and I said to the youth group, okay, that's enough tonight. Let's get in. I don't want to get into it with some irate parent. Let's all go in. And so we, we ended our game that night. But when we got to the teen room, I must confess. I know you're going to think less of me, but I must confess. I laughed. We all kind of had a good laugh out of that because here was this girl, and she got distracted and knocked out. Kind of funny. What a picture of you. What a picture of me. You see, the most important thing in my life and in your life, Christian, ought to be Jesus Christ and His Word. But life... And your enemy and your sin nature is so good at distracting you. Hey, don't worry about the Bible. Don't. It's all about your house. and It's all about your occupation. And it's all about your motorcycle. And it's all about your hobbies and what makes you happy. And we get so distracted from what really is the main thing in all of our lives, if indeed we're saved. And by the way, this is going to offend you. But I am told that when I stand in front of a group like this, and I do this all the time, anywhere from 25 to 50% of you are unsaved. Dr. Rod Bell, who used to pastor a church of 900 up in, in near D.C., used to stand in front of his congregation and say, I believe that probably half of you are unsaved. I don't know what your personal condition is. I do know this, my friend, that if indeed you're the real deal, God's Word endeavors to stir you. God endeavors to stir you. But life and your old nature, your sin nature, is so good at distracting you. Oh, no, 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 no. Do other stuff. Other stuff's more important. It's not. Do you understand that? This was such a huge issue, people. I'm going to take you in closing.
to another book in the Bible that's a last will and testament, a valedictorian address written by a man who knows he's about to die. That book in the Old Testament, anybody want to take a guess? Deuteronomy. Would you turn that with me, please? Deuteronomy. Written by Moses, a dearly loved man of God. Moses knows he's about to die. God has told him, I'm going to take you home here pretty soon. I want you to sit down and write this one last letter. Much of Deuteronomy, people, was sung. Much of Deuteronomy was a hymn. God loves it when His people sing theology. Your music is so incredibly significant to what your heart is like spiritually. But in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses is kind of uh, reviewing what God had done for this nation called Israel. How He had delivered it. And they're about to go into the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 8 is written just before they're about to go into the promised land, led by Joshua. Deuteronomy is written by a man who knows he's about to die. Everybody with me? Deuteronomy chapter 8. Could I start reading with you in verse number 7? Now watch this, would you please? Verse number 7, Deuteronomy chapter 8. The Bible tells us, Moses is talking, and he says, For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water. Oh, that was so important in the Middle East. Of fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. Verse 8. A land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates. Any of you ever had a pomegranate? My wife loves them. Pomegranates and a land of oil, olive, and honey. In other words, folks, they're going to have really good grocery stores. Right? Verse number 9. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron, so they can make weapons and farm tools. And out of those, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. Very important in building. Verse 10. When thou hast eaten and art full. Would you look at me just for a few moments? Is there anything wrong with being full? No. Is there anything wrong with eating? No, we love it. Not a thing wrong. But Moses is not condemning them for enjoying wheat and barley and pomegranates and iron and brass. In other words, they're going to be wealthy. They're going to be really well off. Is there anything wrong with that? No! No! But let's read on. I'm, uh, I'm in verse 10. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Verse 11. Now watch this, Christians. Beware Watch out, Greenville Christians. Watch out. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Would you look at me for a second? That's ludicrous. Ludicrous. Wait a minute, Mike. God's people, the Jews, forgetting God? Ridiculous. No way. Ah, but look what he says. Let's read on. Watch this. Verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments. That would be the Bible. And his judgments. That would be the Bible. And his statutes. That would be the Bible. Which I command thee this day. Verse 12. Here's how it's going to happen. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full. Nothing wrong with that. And hast built goodly houses. Nothing wrong with that. And dwell therein. Nothing wrong with that. And when thy, ha and when thy hands... And thy flocks multiply. Is that did I read that right? Is it herds? Herds. Thank you. Herds. And when thy herds, thank you. And thy flocks multiply. Folks, there's nothing wrong with that. And thy silver and thy gold is multiplied. Bank accounts are full. Nothing wrong with that. And all that thou hast is multiplied. Folks, nothing wrong with that. Verse 14. Here's the danger. Then thine heart be filled up, lifted up. That's pride. And thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Okay, would you look at me for a moment before I read on. I am looking at Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, every one of you, without exception, is wealthy. Every one of you. In November, I spent three weeks in the Philippines. I saw for the first time in my life real, genuine squalor. 
and poverty. You, every one of you, are incredibly wealthy. I know you may not feel like it because you're comparing yourself to Donald Trump. I know you may not feel like it because you're comparing yourself to your neighbor. But every single one of you are incredibly wealthy, including your speaker. And the natural dynamic of wealth, Americans, is to lift your heart. And when your heart is full and satisfied, you got to fight something. Pride. Your pride is going to cause you to forget. What are you going to forget? Well, look, would you please, at verse 14, jump down to verse, excuse me, verse 17. Here's what's going to happen in your heart. And thou shalt say in thine heart, My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. Verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee power to get wealth, that He may be established his, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Ladies and gentlemen, it is so easy for us to get distracted. Our wealth, the things we enjoy, the blessings we have as Christians here in this country can cause us to get proud. You ever met a proud American? I sure have. And what happens with that pride? It will always like that outfielder in that softball game will knock you out and cause you to forget because you got distracted. And somebody who's forgetful, it's so very, very hard to stir them. God wants to stir you. It is my prayer. I don't know in whose life God is going to answer this this morning. But it is my prayer that God would stir some of you. That you would walk out of here and have a purpose in your heart. You know, that bald guy was right. I need to make Jesus Christ my main focus. I need to make His Word my main focus. When His Word is your main focus, Christian, you're going to read it every day. You're going to read it every day. You're going to memorize it. You're going to want to live it. It's going to have an effect on what you watch on TV. It's going to have an effect on the way you dress. It's going to have an effect on what you drink. It's going to have an effect on the way you live. But our enemy, oh, he loves to distract you. I don't know what the distractions you fight in your life. I know I got a gob. I have to fight him. You have to fight him, Christian, in order to be what God wants you to be. And you want that if indeed you're saved. Can we have a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this service this morning. Thank you for the burden you gave each and every heart that is here to be here. Thank you for the safety you gave. But God, most importantly, thank you for the salvation that we enjoy that none of us deserve. God, we know it's so easy for us to get lifted up and proud of our children, of our grandchildren, of our jobs, of our homes, of our accomplishments. But God, we need to be reminded you're the one that gave all of that to us. It's by your goodness that we have what we have. God, I pray for every one of these Christians that have heard this this morning, that they would just refocus their hearts and know that you are endeavoring to stir them. You want them stirred. You want them moved. Lord, just like Red Skelton did to me last night, God, you want us to be that way towards your word. And I pray that that would be the prayer of every genuine saint here this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.